So welcome everyone to Tips and Tricks for working with Bill of Materials in Inventor. Today's presenter is Mark Flayler, who is our Senior Solutions Consultant here at Imagine Technologies. So with that, Mark, I'd like to hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Lori. So I don't need to reintroduce myself there. And uh, you may already know, and you have some background information here that um, you know, I hope everybody knows, but generally during these tips and tricks seminars, we try to make sure that you pick up one little nuggets of information here and there as well. Uh, so I'm going to try and drop in some additional things that uh, weren't even really in the um, original contents for this. So we'll kind of pick up on those as we go through it. But we're going to do a quick bill material overview. Uh, we're going to talk about the expanded structured bill materials and those of you who might uh, need a reason for using it. We'll talk about working with phantom assemblies, virtual components, and lastly, exporting that bill material information. And if you've ever attended my tips and tricks seminars before, uh, you know that I, I generally do a little bit of PowerPoint and then I jump into demonstration because who wants to just attend PowerPoints? So we're going to go ahead and just get this out of the way and start talking about bill materials. So the bill material or the BOM is one of the more important things that you have as part of your documentation with your fabrication drawings or anything else that you're creating out of the inventor software. Um, also just a good tip and trick here, don't talk about the BOM when you're flying on airplanes with other engineers. They tend to get restless when you talk about the bomb, so don't do that. Uh, but we will consider that the bill material is a very important part of our overall documentation. And I also find commonly that people mistake bill material with parts list, and they try to interchange those two things a lot. Uh, generally, the bill material, though, is the master set of information that goes into your overall design of your assembly. And the parts list is simply a on-document representation of your bill material, which can be heavily modified or butchered depending on what your company standards are surrounding parts lists. So let's try not to intermingle those too much, but they do have some correlation to each other. So we'll go through some general steps here, you know, how to generate the bill material, add, add properties, modify the properties, organize and export it and also some things about synchronization. So first of all, our bill material command, uh, we find this on our manage tab. It's also on our assembly tab now too. A uh, little known tidbit of information, I was responsible for getting that back on that assemble tab, so you're welcome everybody. Autodesk actually listened to me. Um, when going to our bill material command, we have three tabs available inside of there. Uh, the model data tab, which is essentially the same um, information you'd find in your model browser is just shown there again for you. Then we also have a structure tab and a parts only tab. Now the structure tab is where we're going to spend a lot of time discussing throughout this tips and tricks uh, session. Uh, basically we can do a lot of things inside there to adjust and manipulate our structured bill material for how that appears in our parts list downstream. We also have a parts only tab which is very commonly used if you do a lot of stick frame steel and you don't care about sub-assemblies at all, you would just like to see the parts and that's it. So basically it will show you your normal parts and if you have a purchased kit, that would also appear in your parts only tab. Generally these are not turned on by default unless you've turned them on in your templates. So you might have to right click into enable the bomb view on either one of these tabs that you would like to have. Once we get into the bill material command and we're on whatever tab we want to adjust or play around with, we can also add columns and custom I properties. So we do have a command called add columns and custom I properties for this reason. The add columns allows you to add any standard I property columns that you might want to adjust. Now, one of the biggest things I really enjoy about the bill material command is the ability to adjust all of the I properties of the children so long as they are checked out to you and you have ownership of them without having to go directly to the file itself. So for instance, I'm a pretty lazy material assignment guy. I don't like assigning materials at the part level because it's just an extra step to do at every single part level. If I look at my bill material though, I can actually add the material column and then adjust materials using copy and paste and basically fill out my material information very quickly all done at the assembly level without having to open up every single part file. Same can be said for adjusting project numbers or descriptions or anything else you would like to adjust 
inside of your bill material. It will feed itself back down into your part files and subassemblies. Now for customized properties, this speaks to anything you have on the custom tab. And one of the biggest tips I can give you about adjusting your columns and your iProperty columns for custom ones is to add these to your templates. So if you open up your assembly template explicitly, which not a lot of people do that, let's be fair, a lot of people create start parts and start drawing templates, but not a lot of people adjust their standard IAM template. If you open that up and go to your bill material command, you can go ahead and pre-fill out what columns you want to have for every assembly, what custom iProperty columns you would like to have show up, and uh, if you want to have your structured or parts only tabs enabled ahead of time. So that's a big tip I can give you on that one. Now again, we can change our eye properties inside of this. As you can see here, this is my example of adjusting material. So you can see from a pull down, I can pick a new material from that list. I can also copy and paste that to other rows. This build material command has come a long way in the past, I don't know, five or six years. It's always been a powerful command, but now it feels more Excel based. You can actually do copy and paste. You can do a row cell fill down. You can do a find replace. You can do an auto capitalize. Uh, that one was very, very much appreciated when they brought on the auto capitalize function. And also, when you select any one of these rows in the bill material, the part or sub assembly inside of your model space will actually highlight to show you what you're selecting. Also, a very helpful thing to get a better understanding of what you're trying to adjust. Now, one of the biggest things we normally adjust here as well, though, is the bill material structure, and that's done typically on the model data tab. Now, as you create new parts and new assemblies from scratch, everything gets set to this normal bill material structure, and you might have to adjust it to something else. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. But you can also override quantities and equivalent components here. You can also do uh, row merge settings as well. But let's talk about these bill material structures. So normal, essentially you fabricate this. You make this part or this sub-assembly. It's, it's normally counted based on the structure that it's in. Inseparable refers to things like, that are uh, basically have to be physically broken to be separated, things like weldments. So if you create a new uh, assembly from a weldment template, it automatically will be set to inseparable. And we also have purchase components, which is 100% everything out of Content Center. So anything you pull out of there will be put into a purchase bill material structure. I have seen some companies that wish to have their fasteners or co Content Center items in a different bill material structure. Uh, they'll actually take the time to go through and duplicate their Content Center and create a separate phantom um, Content Center. So anything that's placed around becomes a phantom bill material item instead. That just depends on how you order things and how you typically like things reported. Uh, but purchase is a way that you can help identify that. It's also a nice way to sort your bill material or your parts list based on that structure. So then you can then renumber it based on having all your purchased items, let's say at the beginning or at the end, or maybe they start with 100 or 300 for purchased items. Now, getting into Phantom a little bit more, this is a, a more common one. People use this one all the time when they need to. And it's essentially used for modeling convenience. So if I have a kit, let's call it a sub-assembly kit of some kind that I order, or my customers can order, um, or maybe it's just a way that I wanna put parts together into a sub-assembly, but then have it be ignored. There's a lot of ways you can control how you wanna do things with Phantom. But the biggest thing to remember about what it does is it actually promotes the level of the bill material structure of the subcomponents. So if I have a subassembly and I have five parts inside of that subassembly, they traditionally do not show up in that bill of material at the high level. When you make them phantom, they will take those bill material items and promote them up into that top level from a subassembly. And you have to do that one step at a time. So if you have multiple phantoms and you want to keep promoting them all the way up, you kind of have to follow that chain. Now the last one here, reference, allows you to exclude things from counts altogether. This is very common for things that are added to an assembly for visual reference. Like here's my piece of industrial machinery, and here's a column that the customer wanted me to dimension to. That column is not something I fabricate, nor am I responsible for it, so it becomes a reference item and is not included in my bill material whatsoever. 
Now, if you start getting into more of the settings inside of the film material, uh, we can do row order sorting and renumbering, and we can do that based on certain rows we have selected. And one tip I did not throw up here, and it's actually kind of a neat tip, is the ability to lock your bill material rows so the numbers don't change no matter what. And I can speak to a little bit of that when I demonstrate about why that might be important. You can also do part number merge settings. So if a part number is the same, it can roll the quantities into the same row. Now, one of the bigger topics involved in this tips and tricks session is talking about structured properties. We do have a little magnifying glass looking icon inside the build material command, which allows you to take what you have here of one, two, three, four, five uh, from the arm bracket base down to the cylinder and basically expand it out. When you choose that command, you can select to structure your bill material for all levels and choose a delimiter. And from that, you can then break that out. So there you can see once this is chosen, you choose all levels, you choose your delimiter. And in the lower left image, you can see you'll get a plus sign in front of all of your items. These can then be expanded out to show 2, 2-1, 2 2-5. If you go even further than that, it'd be 2-5-1 to break it down even further. This has the ability to then propagate to your parts list. So inside of a parts list edit, you can actually see plus signs there as well to show those expanded bill material rows. And depending on how you document and how you like to document, this might be a necessary thing that you need to have. And hopefully you've already found it if it is a necessary item for you to have. I typically find this done a lot with uh, frame steel for frames of industrial equipment where they don't need to have separate subassemblies. They just want to show, well, um, this subassembly is put together as item two, but I have 2-1, 2-2, and 2-3 are different sticks of steel, and I don't want to have to create separate documents for all those different drawings. Now, we also have an engineer's notebook in here as well, in case you need to access that, and also your exporting ability to export to different uh, types. So you can export to database types, spreadsheets, text, Cell, a lot of different types of exports you have available. You can also write iLogic rules to help you do the exporting on an automatic basis. So as you can see here from the iLogic window for 2019, you have the ability to export to Access, Excel, uh, different database formats, text files with tab or comma delimited, Unicode text files as well. So many different options available there. And you can see I highlighted a few more iLogic build material tools as well for overriding quantity and calculating quantities based on how you like to uh, use your coding. Some last uh, items here about synchronization of the bill material and parts list. A lot of people have a hard time with this, especially novices. Uh, you can really tell a novice when you uh, look at their parts list and you see how much blue is inside of it. So here you can see I have a parts only tab. Let's say I modify it from five to seven. The parts list will automatically update from five to seven as well if you change it in your bill material. If you change it in your parts list, you have the ability to change that item override back to the bill material as you see in the lower right image. So the blue is actually an overrided value. If you save the overrides back to the bomb, it will update the bill material. That only works for item numbers. If you change a description, a part number, or anything else that's in your parts list, it will remain blue, and the bill material and the parts list will be out of sync. You cannot synchronize those unless you toggle off the static value that you see highlighted in red down there. That will then return your parts list override back to the calculated value that comes from your bill material. So, it's kind of a nice thing to do if you're you know, hiring somebody new in and you want them to make a parts list look a certain way. If you, basically, if you look in their parts list and you see blue all over the place, um, it's not necessarily a good thing. It means they don't quite understand the relationship between I properties of your modeling files and your documentation parts lists and how they need to look. So be aware of that. Um, if your company is a habitual blue parts list company, then maybe reevaluate how you fill in your I properties of your modeling files. Now, one last bit on here, if you want to lock your item numbers, again, you can select them inside of your bill material and choose lock items. That will prevent that number from changing when you do a renumbering 
or if you try to add or remove additional rows. And again, I'll kind of get into that a little bit more when I demonstrate. One of our last topics here before we get to the actual inventor modeling environment is talking about virtual components. And companies handle these things differently. A virtual component is basically a component that you add to the assembly and it appears as a kind of a glass box icon. You can see that here in the right side as grease. So this component basically carries with the assembly wherever it goes. It doesn't create a separate IPT, it simply is inside the assembly and it gets put into the build material. You can control how that build material looks by adjusting eye properties and component settings of said virtual component. So for instance, grease doesn't have to be one. It could be 15 milliliters. It could be um, anything you want to put down as a unit of measure for it. And that is controlled again through those component settings and the eye properties. Now, another way that companies typically handle things they might consider virtual is I might create a IPT file with nothing in it but the metadata of what it is. And they do that so the file can be checked in and checked out and lifecycle maintained, let's say through a vault system, or that they can place it into a design with the same settings wherever they want. So virtual components are one way to do it, but you can also create empty modeling files to accomplish a very similar goal. It just depends on how you like to manage your file set. So we're gonna get into some demonstrations here of some different build material scenarios. And we're gonna talk about a few other things that I didn't have in my PowerPoint as well. All right, so let's start up here with this little puzzle kit. So this is a little puzzle kit that I, I have. Actually, I modeled it up because I was bored one day. And this essentially has a couple different positions. It has an open and closed position for this little case, and these little parts go inside of it, so it's kind of cool. But the purpose of this is I need to include an instruction sheet, and I need that to be actually part of my build material, so when I export this to an ERP system or something else, I kind of want Inventor to control that document that says I need to have an instruction sheet included with this. So what I'm gonna do is create a virtual component. I'm gonna go up here to my Assemble tab, and I'm gonna choose my Create command. And if you choose a virtual component right away, you'll see that the file location and template actually go away. You can still choose a build material structure. So, you know, this is a normal thing. We actually make these here. So let me call this one instruction sheet. I'll say okay. And it's gonna add that to my modeling tree here on the left-hand side. So what this is essentially done is if I create a build material or if I export this, it will have an instruction sheet included as a row. When I go to my parts list on my drawing, it will also have an instruction sheet listed as something that I need to include or something that's included with this. So if I go to my build material command up here on my manage tab on the assemble panel, you can see structured is currently disabled. If I right click on this and enable the bomb view, I can then see everything. So I have parts one through 12, including my virtual component. If I look at parts only, it's gonna look very similar because I have no sub-assemblies there. So for that bottom case, and you can see that that is a promoted block case. Okay. Let's take a look at another example. Let's take a look at adjusting some structure. So here's an arm assembly. This has multiple sub-assemblies here. When I look at the bill material for this, I'm going to notice that everything is currently in a normal build material structure. Now, the cylinder, I don't really make these. I buy them. So I'm going to make these a purchased component. So it simply just changes that structure. Nothing really adjusts as far as um, quantity or how it gets reported. It's just something I can then sort based on build material structure. It gives me a nice little ability to filter. Now, if I go to my structured tab, again, you'll see that I have normal, 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 normal purchased. Well, maybe the top arm, middle arm, and lower arm are simply put together for my own personal modeling purposes. I don't actually have separate drawings for them, and everything gets included in the same drawing package. So I don't want to create sub-assembly prints for all this stuff, or I mean, I just don't want it broken out that way. I'm going to change each one of these here on the model tab 
to a phantom bill material structure. There we go. So now that these are all changed, when I look at my structured tab, you'll see that a lot of the components that were made up, made, that are making up that particular uh, set of subassemblies have been promoted up. You no longer see those same names, you actually see some uh, number designations. When I go back to my model tab, you can see as I expand these out, that those actually make up those numbers. So it takes them and moves them up in the tree, and then I can simply renumber these now. So I go ahead and do that, a renumber of items starting with one, and then make that's how I want my bill material to look. Now, if I want to expand these out further, I can look at my structured bill material by going up to my little magnifying glass here and clicking on View Properties. I want to show all levels, and I like a delimiter of a dash, so I'm going to keep that one. I'll select OK, and I now have plus signs on my structured tab in front of each one of these subassemblies. As I expand those out, you can see just how expanded they can be. There we go. Now, as I look through some of this, um, I'm pretty happy with what I have here, but maybe I want to change something back from a phantom bill material structure back to a normal one. You'll notice that you don't have any phantom references here. So you actually have to go back to model tab, and I'm going to change lower arm back to a normal bill material structure. And when I look at my structured tab, you can see that it took that number seven and basically rolled it back up into number 11 now. So I'm going to go ahead and renumber this again, one through nine. Okay. Now, what if something gets added or removed, and I don't want those numbers to keep adjusting? I want them always to be, let's say, I want lower arm always to be number nine, no exceptions, it's always number nine. Well, I can right-click on this and lock that item. So now if I were to go back and expand out some more bill material items, such as, oh, my arm bracket base, let's make that one phantom. That's going to add some more numbers. So I have 9 and 10 and 11 here. And even if I try to reorder these things and then renumber it, starting start with one up here, I do have one or more items that are locked. The item number of the locked rows will not be changed. So you can see there I now actually have a duplicate. So I need to make that one 10. Now, here's the reasoning why a lot of people lock these rows. Let's say that I release a print, and item row number nine is called lower arm N. And then I revise the modeling data, I revise the print, and now modeling uh, item row number nine is now the next one down. Let's say it's 31361149252. Someone who's already consumed that print and knows that item number nine is lower arm now has to be told that the numbers have changed and that the item row number 10, or let's say number eight, is now the lower arm. So it becomes kind of a communication thing where some companies like to say that, you know what, once I release this, I lock all my rows, and then if I change it, and I get rid of, let's say, item number nine, then I go from eight to 10 to 11. I skip nine, and nine's no longer there forever. And that basically just depends on how you like the document. That's certainly one thing you could do if you wanted to be more restrictive of how you do your revisions and how you do your item numbering inside of your prints. I do have quite a few clients that actually do that. Let me go ahead and close this. And let's take a look at another one. Let's take a look at manually demoting something into some sub-assemblies and then working with that. So here I have a raised garden bed. I actually built this uh, uh, two springs ago. And I'm going to go ahead and take these components here and demote them into a sub-assembly because this is very much the vertical portion of it compared to the base portion. And I'm going to go ahead and just have them selected, right-click, go to Component, and choose Demote. And I make sure I save this into the correct area. I'm going to call this one Pergola. This will be normal bill material structure using a standard IAM. I'm going to go ahead and restructure those. And it didn't like that. Let's restructure just a few components.
let's say just the Arbor Sports, just for simplicity. There we go. All right, so those are now demoted into Arbor Sports. And I want those to be phantom because I just wanted to organize them here. So I go to my bill material. I'll find my new Arbor Sports. Actually, it's going to help to save this first. So I get my previews. So they added a couple of years ago were these thumbnails, which is quite nice. So here's my normal bill material structure. I'll change him to phantom. Now, I want you to notice that a lot of these colors here are not the colors I have inside the assembly because I have actually some color overrides in there. I'm going to go up here and add some columns. And I want to make sure my materials are set the way that I want. So I'm going to add this material column here. And there, lo and behold, it's everybody's favorite material, generic. So I would like to adjust this to a kind of a wood type. So I'll choose this here and see if I can't find some wood. I think of I actually made this out of cedar, and I'm just going to make uh, something close, maybe oak. So I'm just going to do a copy and paste here. And there's also a little tiny arrow. I mean, this is something hard to see. If you guys got bifocals, get them out. Because this little bottom corner right here is very similar to an Excel drag. And I can actually drag those down to fill out the materials. There we go. So now those are dragged down that way. Now, if I also want to adjust things like my stock number or my description, so I know this one here is a 4x4 four four post, and maybe I'll just one call this one 4x4. Four four. Number. Again, there's my problem not having the caps lock on, so I could right-click on it and choose Capitalize to automatically adjust that up. And I have something else in here that is 4x4 four four lumber as well. I believe it is going to be my Arbor supports. So I have four of those. Outer wall. Here's the other Arbor post. That's also a four by four. So I'll just paste that down there. So you can very quickly follow your data without having to go into separate files. If I right click, you'll also notice there is find and replace capabilities there, copy and paste, and also an open. So if I want to open this file directly from the bill material command, I now have that ability as well. That's a fairly new feature. I can't quite remember if it was 17 or 18 that they added it. Now, if I move this off to the side here, you'll see that as I click through, my parts do highlight for what they actually are. So it gives me a good indication of what I'm working with. Now let's start looking at documentation a little bit. Let's go back to this ARM system, and I'm going to create a drawing from this guy quick. This is my standard IDW. I'm going to go ahead and place in a parts list. Now, as you place in a parts list, you can choose structure or parts only. So I'm going to choose structured here. Drop it in. As I go ahead and edit my parts list by right-clicking on it, you see I do have those plus signs in front of there now for the expanded bill material. You do not get those unless you actually expand it using the bill material command. But don't worry, if you forgot to do it inside the assembly, you can right click on the parts list and you can access the bill material from right here. So obviously this will modify the existing intelligence of your design that leads into the drawing and everything else that it is basically tied to. Whereas the parts list itself here is simply an override. So here I forgot to fill out a description for the lower arm. And if I'll say in here, I'm like, uh, der, this is the lower arm, and that's my silly voice. You can see that it is in a color, color of blue there. Let me know it's an override. This does not actually modify the eye property. You can't right click on here and save that override back to the bill material. So if I were to go to that lower arm assembly, it would still basically be blank. So this is not something you should do because you're not really carrying down the intelligence of your design of the metadata. The only time you should really override this is if it really needs to be an override just for this sheet and this sheet alone. So to return it back to its normal value, you can right click on this 
and toggle off the check mark in front of static value. There we go. Now, if you need to export your parts list, of course, you can do that as well. You have an export option right here. If you go to your bill material, you can also view your exporting inside of this as well. It's the very first command, export your bill material. So you can do structured all levels and then spit it out to whatever format you desire. So very helpful there. And one last good tidbit of information here, and this is for anyone that uses eye assemblies on a normal basis. Um, I'm not a huge fan of eye parts or eye assemblies that kind of gone the way of the dodo a little bit, but they still fall into a lot of workflows for certain companies. Um, I tend to use iLogic more now than anything else. And anyone that has utilized vaults before with eye parts and eye assemblies know of some of the pitfalls involving them for how they need to be updated and how ownership needs to take place with the factory members and such. But uh, what I have here is basically a loader, a little child's toy. Um, it goes from a small to a large orientation, which basically switches out some of the sub-assemblies and parts that go into it. So what does this really have to do with bill material? Well, what does a bill material for an eye assembly look like is really the big question, because I'm actually you know, adding components and getting rid of components. So there should be quantity null of some and quantity one or two of others, right? Well, when you look at your bill material command, when you deal with eye assemblies, when you go to your structured tab, you actually have a new pull down available up here at the top. This can then filter your I assembly member columns for your different variations. So here's my large loader. You can see down below I have zero, zero, one, and one. But when I toggle this to the small loader, those numbers invert themselves to one and one, zero and zero, based on what's included there. And this does actually transcribe to your parts list pretty well as, as, in uh, regards to that too. So here I'll create a drawing view for this guy of a standard IDW. And I'll go ahead and drop this guy in. For my model state, I want the large loader, that's fine. Okay. And let's go ahead and bring in a parts list for this guy. Now, if I were to go in here and edit this parts list, you can see I have zeros and ones on that. And we also have member selection. So I can also include the small loader. This is only available when you have an I assembly type table, this member select. So I'm going to go ahead and say okay. And that brings it in for large quantity and small quantity loader. It's zero for this, one for this, and vice versa for the other. So it kind of gives you the ability to have multiple tabulated or charted drawings for your I assembly available on the same. Very, very neat thing to have um, if you are still using I assemblies uh, for your documentation. Let's jump back over here to just showing everything. And this essentially kind of gets to the point where I'm ready for some questions uh, based on what we had talked about through here and you know, general bill material. So we're going to go ahead and open this up, uh, Lori, if you'd like. 